Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our audience. And uh, thank you so much to London Business School Investment Management Club for making this event possible. Before I start with the actual uh, lecture, I want to start by emphasizing that value investing is about the real world. It's highly connected to the real world of producing goods and services that enhance the livelihood of the people. Uh, value investing is about mobilizing the savings of our society and putting it and deploying it into the best and most productive enterprises. So in that sense, uh, I think this particular discipline uh, is very useful in today's world where there's so much uh, gaming, even gambling and financial engineering uh, in uh, financial services. But here we're talking about the real world and identifying the best businesses to invest in. I'll just very quickly uh, supplement Derek's uh, introduction by talking a little bit about who I represent. Uh, I represent, I'm the co-chairman, co-founder of uh, Value Partners, which has been uh, in business for 28 years. We are a Hong Kong-based asset management company, roughly 200 people in Hong Kong and about 40 in uh, Shanghai. And, uh, a few other offices scattered around the Asia Pacific region. And uh, we have one mission, which is to buy the three R's, the right business, run by the right people, at the right price. So that's one way to define value investing, the three R's. Uh, this approach remains effective. In fact, so far this year, we have seen uh, quite a bit of a switch away from what the media calls growth back into value investing. Uh, but having said that, I have been in this, uh, I've been practicing uh, value investing for over three decades. What I can say is that based on my experience, it's really more of an art than a science. It evolves, it must blend into a changing environment to remain effective. Uh, value Partners today uh, is, uh, we call it a tempo of value investing. We are very much uh, involved in uh, research company visits more than uh, 7,000 company visits a year. Uh, our flagship fund, uh, which is uh, devoted to Greater China, uh, has a size of 1.74 billion US dollars. Uh, total funds under management is about 13 billion, but there are various other funds uh, dedicated to various other types of uh, equity and fixed income. But this flagship fund that uh, have been around since April the 1st, 19. 93, has achieved a net return to clients of 5,489% since inception. That's equivalent to a net return over 28 years compounded of 15.4% per annum. I believe this is one of the best uh, investment track records of uh, any mutual fund in the world over the same period of time. So we are at the point where I finish my introduction about Value Partners' uh, track record, noting that our fund, which is a pretty large fund, 1.4 to 1.5 billion US, has been able to deliver to clients a net return of 15.4% per annum, compounded over 28 years, and uh, been able to do so with uh, well below levels of uh, volatility. So high return, uh, lower risk. Now, I also went on to talk about uh, our core market, which is mainland China, where I've been able to show you statistics that uh, show that active fund management still can outperform the index. This is uh, becoming less and less true of the developed Western markets, where many active funds are struggling to even match the index returns, hence the growing popularity of exchange-traded funds. But here in East and Southeast Asia, markets remain less efficient, a diligent research and uh, active uh, stock picking still deliver uh, above average returns. So that's the good news. Then we went on to talk about uh, how people like me make a profit from stock market investing and we segregated it or we broke it down into the three components of returns. Increase in earnings per share, dividend yield, and a change in the PE multiple we rating. And uh, I got to say that throughout the 1990s, when Value Partners was still a young company, the PE ratio of our home market here in Hong Kong was very stable. 
it, it didn't change very much from one year to the next. So we make our money simply by identifying stocks, able to deliver increase in earnings per share and a nice dividend yield. So I still recall in those days, the, uh, the kind of stocks we bought had earnings per share increases of roughly 10% and dividend yields of roughly 5%. So if you look at the track record of my fund, you'll find that we fairly consistently achieve a 15% return per annum uh, in our performance. Uh, so 10% from earnings per share, 5% from dividend. Things only started to change after the global financial crisis of 2008. That's when uh, everything became so dependent on people's willingness to either re-rate or de-rate a stock, i.e. change the PE multiple. Uh, so consequently, you're able to achieve a uh, increase in the PE multiple from eight times to 12 times. You, you will immediately have a 50% increase in the share price. That's much easier than trying to grind out some profits from earnings per share or a dividend yield, which these days are not very exciting. Uh, in our part of the world, uh, earnings per share in recent years have been around the high single digit. Uh, dividend yields have been roughly like 1%, 2%. So to kind of achieve the kind of returns that our clients expect from us and we expect from ourselves, we really need to identify stocks that is capable of PE multiple re-rating. And of course, I just got to remind you, and this has been true in the last couple of days, it can also work the other way around. That PE multiples can de-rate, in which case you can su suffer uh, sizable losses. Just a reminder, uh, the game is not as simple as you would think of just buying stocks in low PE and making money because frankly speaking, uh, low PE multiple could be a value trap. The stock could be cheap because it's cheap for a reason. It could be a highly inferior business. Since 2008, in the era of uh, abundant money printing, abundant liquidity, and very stimulating monetary policies, uh, there has been no shortage of uh, liquidity in the market, generally speaking, to buy good businesses, even when they are at fairly high PE multiples. So if a company or a stock remain at a low multiple, it may actually imply that something is wrong with the company. Anyway, here is a summary slide before we go on to, uh, uh, to make the story a little bit more complicated, which is that, remember, what we really want is high growth in earnings per share, uh, which in recent years has not been that easy. Uh, but of course, this year we are seeing a remarkable, but I think temporary V-shaped uh, recovery because of the COVID last year. We want a high and sustainable dividend. And most importantly, we are looking to buy companies, sectors, or even entire countries where we think the PE multiple, the amount an investor is willing to pay per share, per dollar of earnings, that PE multiple is likely to go up, generally known in the industry jargon as a, a re-rating. So the key question here is, uh, what are you as an investor what can you do to identify, locate, find, and discover catalysts that will produce a re-rating of the stock or the market? And conversely, what do you need to be careful about to avoid being hit very hard by a de-rating or a reduction of the PE multiple? That is the key to uh, successful investing today. Now, we now look at uh, how markets get rated. And I was trying to find a... Uh, a very simple summary, because this is after all a 20 minute uh, talk. Uh, I will say this, the stock market is a mirror of society. The stock market reflects the, be the behavior, the behavior of share prices, reflects the hopes and the fears of society. So anything that exceeds the hope, anything that exceeds the fears of society will cause PEs to either go up or go down. This is really all there is to it. So you, what, you got to know what is society hoping for, what is society afraid of, and then figure out whether or not there's going to be any surprises, one way or the other. So the search for catalyst in my job is basically trying to find things that would uh, beat expectation, that would turn out to be better than what generally is reflected in share prices so far. And also, uh, since the uh, 
global financial crisis of 2008, the macro environment is also a very large factor because of the growing intervention of central banks and governments in, the, uh, in society. I'll go into great detail about this soon. Uh, in general, uh, the environment has been very good for financial assets, for stocks, uh, since 2008, because central banks and governments have been flooding the market with money. There's so much money, uh, money printing going on that uh, it's been a great party. Uh, I know that in recent days, because of uh, fears of rising inflation, leading to uh, uh, fears of uh, rising interest rates, uh, the party has stopped for a while. But my own feeling is that uh, this may only be uh, a, a short break or an interval. The, the conditions remain in place for uh, uh, a celebration of excess liquidity. I was put it that way, yeah. And I think most investors cannot help but uh, want to be part of the party and enjoy it while it lasts. So the macro environment does, uh, is an important reason why uh, BE multiples keep going up for the time being. Uh, I mean, the party goes on until it stops, right? Yeah. Now, uh, for me, the, who, who consider myself a, a die-hard value investor, uh, the best way in normal times to find a catalyst for PE multiple re-rating is simply to find a superior business. Like I say, value investing is connected to the real world. So you want to mobilize people's savings, your client's money, and put it into superior businesses, which for me, a simple definition of a superior business is a, uh, a business model run by great people with durable competitive advantage. That means uh, it's not just a one-shot thing. You know, year after year, they can grind out a high return on equity because they have durable, lasting, sustainable advantages in their business model. Uh, and then you, people like me, I have like uh, roughly 80, 85 people working in my team as research analysts uh, doing uh, several thousand company visits a year to try to locate these superior businesses. There's a lot of trial and error, a lot of mistakes, but eventually we find them. And uh, also classical value investing insists on the margin of safety, which I must admit has become quite difficult to achieve these days in this area of uh, excess liquidity. But Preferably find companies where even in your valuation, there's some room to make some mistakes. Uh, and also your mindset, how you feel when you buy a stock. I don't see a stock as some piece of paper. If I'm a shareholder, I'm a part owner of a business. I think that way, I feel that way. I mean it uh, with the intention to be a long-term investor of a superior business. Now, these are ways where uh, catalysts, in my experience, will emerge. Now, the, the way I have been uh, carrying out value investing has changed though over the years. As I said, it has evolved. These days, the, uh, the jargon word in my team is very much the word quality value investing. Uh, let me explain what, it, what I'm trying to say. Now, in the 1990s, when uh, we started out, our standard textbook in the research department was actually a uh, security analysis by Graham and Dot. I think most building investors are very familiar with that. Uh, there was a lot of emphasis on quantitative methods, finding low PE, high ROE, disaggregating the ROE, and uh, finding how much of it is driven by uh, high mar profit margin versus asset turnover, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but unfortunately in the last, especially uh, maybe 10 years or 15 years, this kind of quantitative tools have become too well known. There's a proliferation of people with CFAs, MBAs, went to finance school, or have access to accounting textbooks of all sorts of descriptions. They know all the ratios we do. They know the financial modeling. Our com competitive advantage has been uh, eroding very quickly. These days, we like to think that we are more, uh, our emphasis is much more on having good judgment, good evaluation, superior interpretation. Our job, is the, not so much finding things at the right price, but the right people and the right business. And that involves qualitative evaluation, not quantitative. And that's the whole key to the puzzle of value investing today, in my view. Today's value investor is really a judge, not a number cruncher. 
the judge who tries to decide what are the management teams and the superior business characteristics that will carry the day on a sustainable basis. So I will emphasize again that uh, the, the key today is to uh, find businesses that are right, the people that are right, and put less emphasis on the right price. Now, coming to the last few concluding slides, I want to uh, pose the question. Remember, these this slides were written before the latest developments where people talk about growth, uh, going back to value investing, right? Uh, and that, uh, of course, of this year, the so-called value style outperformed the so-called growth style. But I don't, I gotta tell you that in my mind, growth and value has blended for many years. And the differences are really one of emphasis. I, I'm not quite with the media who insists on dividing investment styles into growth and value. To me, the two styles share many common characteristics of trying to find PE multiple re-rating catalysts. So if you ask me what is the crisis in value investing today, I'm not going to talk about things like uh, growth, outperforming value, etc. To me, the real crisis is uh, much more serious and uh, it's uh, structural in our society. I think we are facing a crisis in free market capitalism, in the price discovery mechanism. Uh, we are facing a society uh, f consumed by populist politics, by a, uh, a monetary and fiscal policies that directly and indirectly bring about bubble economics. Uh, we are seeing globalization break down. We are seeing uh, massive growth in passive investment styles like ETFs and investment manias. And uh, I'm also seeing that for value investing to function properly, we need to see the concept of uh, creative destruction working, where bad companies are allowed to fail. I'm seeing less and less of that. I'm seeing a lot of government uh, assistance that allow uncompetitive companies and business teams to survive. I'm seeing the hand of government selecting the winners of tomorrow rather than uh, the, 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 the classical forces of demand and supply. I'm seeing the uh, appearance of monopolistic business structures, including here in my hometown in Hong Kong, where uh, free markets do not perform uh, as, as vigorously as they should. I'm seeing a society that has become very dependent on financial engineering. I have read, for example, that uh, paper assets, financial assets now, is five times the size of assets in the real economy. There's a definitely over financialization. I'm seeing uh, economics driven by uh, short-term uh, visions, no, no real long-term vision, and uh, a great emphasis on, uh, for example, CEO compensation as opposed to the long-term interests of all shareholders. So, and I, I referred also to uh, GameStop style, gaming and gambling activities on the, in the financial, in the capital market, as opposed to investing based on being connected to the real world. These are the forces that are making it much more difficult for the original concept of value investing to function, for the concept of buying the right business run by the right people at the right price. It's all getting muddied and distorted. And that's the real crisis of value investing. So, okay, so I think from here, I would say that value investing has to evolve. We must adapt. We must find a way through this uh, uh, very confusing chapter of human history. Uh, I would say that uh, we need to construct a quality portfolio that diversifies across stocks, asset classes, and markets. Uh, still very much anchored on fundamental analysis, but a little bit more realistic about the... Uh, the muddy world we live in. Uh, beyond financial analysis, I think the well-equipped professional investor now needs to be very knowledgeable about history, politics, culture, the sciences, all the subjects, all the subjects that shape the hopes and fears of society. Like I say, it's really about the hopes and fears of society and what will exceed the hope and what will exceed the fears. And to be able to diagnose that, like a good doctor can diagnose an illness, you really need to go beyond financial analysis now. You need to know a lot more about social sciences and natural sciences and etc. Uh, 
In fact, I will go beyond that to say that a value investor needs to look beyond stock picking, which is how I function all through the 1990s, to evaluating entire asset classes, entire markets from a quality perspective. I believe that these days, uh, market bubbles have disguised rising problems in many countries and uh, social tensions are going to create increasing pressures for to put emphasis on redistribution of wealth rather than wealth creation. And uh, I believe that we now have a system that essentially rewards people with wealth because they benefit from inflation in uh, financial assets, stocks and real estate rather than benefit people who work. I think real incomes have stagnated for a very long time. Now, why I'm saying all this is because I'm leading up to my, one of my main points, which is that I think one of the safe havens for value investors today is the China market, the market for China-related stocks. A very quick look at why I, uh, I think China is one of the several possible solutions for value investors who are a bit discouraged by the, uh, many, the rising confusion in what's right, what works and what doesn't work in the investment world today. Uh, China, of course, is still not an expensive market. P is about 14. Uh, it has, a, in my view, stronger social and political stability and financial discipline. Uh, for example, you know, the country last year was able to eliminate extreme poverty. That's an incredible achievement. Bearing in mind that as recently as the early 1960s, people were still starving in China. In China today, uh, there are 400 million middle class people, a number that is likely to double by 2035. That's a great consumer market. One of the key ingredients for a sustainable economic growth is your own big domestic market. And very importantly, less than 10% of Chinese household savings is in the stock market today. The bulk of Chinese savings remain in real estate and in uh, bank, money market, funds and cash, but it's migrating. There is a shift in allocation going on into equities, either through direct purchase or through mutual funds. This will provide great support to uh, the, the, the Chinese uh, stock market in the years to come. Now, to conclude quickly, uh, I want to trace my own journey as a one value investor. Uh, in the 1990s, you could say my real style was buy low, sell high. Today's style is I buy right, I sit tight, and I blend in. I exercise judgment to choose and identify superior businesses. And I'm very fussy about going to the right markets, the right countries. And I go beyond financial analysis to consider social, political, and other factors. Of course, I don't want to overpay. I'm very mindful how much I'm paying. Uh, but I got to say that I no longer worry too much about the so-called differences between growth and value. I want to be anchored in fundamental analysis, that's true. Uh, but I think that uh, the search for catalyst is very, very critical. And the uh, situational awareness of the environment you're operating in, the ability to make or lose a lot of money today can, go be, uh, can be due to forces beyond one's uh, imagination. So on this note, may I wish you happy investing and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, that was a really insightful presentation. I really like your philosophy uh, regarding uh, the catalyst and also uh, how value invest, uh, investing involved uh, through uh, different decades. And I saw a lot of questions on, on the Q&A box. Unfortunately, we cannot answer uh, them all. Uh, but due to the time constraints, I will just uh, choose the most uh, popular ones. The first one is also the one I, I'm particularly interested in. So uh, it's a question from Aaron, uh, Master of Finance students from Riley School. He asked uh, Mr. Che, so what kind of factors differentiate the Chinese equity markets for active managers to still outperform compared to Western developed, mark, uh, developed markets? Yeah. And uh, maybe I, I have also a question, let's say, um, uh, in addition to that, what do you face, what kind of challenge do you face for the next decade for Chinese markets, particularly for value uh, investing uh, uh, asset managers. Yeah, the, uh, I think these are very 
excellent questions. And it's one that we are very preoccupied with. It has evolved, of course. But uh, the one factor that remains unchanged is that uh, the vast majority of the buying and selling in the domestic markets in uh, Shanghai and uh, Samchen are retail investors. I can't remember the exact number, you, you, but you can easily find out. I, I think something like 80% of the buying and selling is done by uh, local retail investors. And uh, these guys have a very short-term casino mentality. They, 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 some, a lot of them are intraday and uh, they, do, they don't really do a lot of research. They are not based on fundamentals. They are momentum people. I can show you various charts that show that they tend to buy high and sell low, the opposite of what they should be doing. So in a way that is very favorable for professional investors like us, because we have the research, we are more long-term, and uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, financial modeling and asking all these questions about what are good companies, what are not. So I see that, uh, that my uh, assistant, Brian Lim, has put a slide that shows you very clearly that uh, actively managed funds do outperform significantly over any period of time you care to mention. So this is the good news about Chinese market. I hope you agree with me that, you know, you can make money by doing a good job, which is great. Uh, your other question is, what are the challenges uh, we face? I think there are various challenges, but I, I must admit, I'm uh, not really able to come out with a lot of factors right now, because I'm very optimistic. You can sense that. I'm, uh, I think that for me, as a Hong Kong-based firm, the greatest single challenge is that when are they going to open the door a little bit wider? Because there are all sorts of restrictions and uh, uh, sort of, uh, we can't do what we really want to do because there has been a long history of uh, restrictions and limitations on the, the activities of Hong Kong and foreign investors and, and firms in the China market. We would like to see more liberalization. Now, the, the other thing is that for foreign trained farm managers like you and me, we also must understand that the form of capitalism practiced on the mainland of China is a form of capitalism known as state capitalism. It's different from the kind of capitalism that we were taught and that is practiced, for example, in Hong Kong or possibly in the United Kingdom. Uh, stakeholder capitalism, for me, probably has a, a longer-term runway in terms of the future because it's a form of... Uh, State capitalism is very similar to the concept of shareholder, uh, stakeholder capitalism. It tries to take care not only of shareholders, but also employees, the society, the consumers, everybody. There's a bit of it for everybody. It's a kind of more responsible and things more long term. Whereas the classical form of capitalism that we were taught is essentially shareholder capitalism, focusing on increasing earnings and dividends only for the owners, the shareholders, and also, of course, for the uh, management staff. I think that kind of capitalism, frankly speaking, is not looking very sustainable to me. So when you go to China, you'll find that if your main motivation is to make a lot of money for your shareholders and your management, you may run into difficulties with the local government because they are very interested in social stability. So they want you to share what you got with the society, with the consumer and with the lower ranking employees as well. So they can, you can, it takes a while to adjust to that. Uh, I'm not trying to make a political judgment here, it's just my own personal observation. Yeah, thank you. I, I think to be honest, that's one of my uh, hope as well, you know, which the Chinese economy could be open more or to embrace more for the foreigner uh, investors, mm -hmm. particularly for the next five decades, uh, a, a few decades. And, uh, the, with the time constraint, we, let's just uh, uh, f uh, allow one more question. So the question from uh, Roland Samuel, a manager from UIC. So he, uh, his question is, because you have talked a lot, uh, a lot of, about, let's say, quantitative factors, PE, ROE, and you also said that qualitative indicators are also in, uh, very important going forward, uh, particularly for, uh, for the value investors. So his question is, what are your qualitative indicators for valuation? Mm. Uh, the first is, uh, actually, I'm just telling you what is on our spreadsheet. So there's no, no real, I mean, it's no, no, not rocket science. Uh, we look a lot at the SWOT, uh, SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats facing the business. And we don't want the analysts to give me numbers. We want a, a words, in summary in words. What do you think are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats facing the business? Why do you think the business has a sustainable 
competitive advantage. Please give me an idea of the what you think is the quality of the management, and uh, do you have any uh, like second or third opinions about their track record and their integrity, etc. Uh, in the last, since 2000, either 14 or 15, there's also an ESG element because it's very big with our clients now from around the world. So we want to know whether the company is ESG compliant and we don't want quantitative evaluation. We would like you to tell us why you think the company is a ESG sensitive to ESG uh, kind of company. Uh, we also have been, uh, I don't know whether it's relevant to the question, but I, I just want to mention briefly that we also have been exp uh, very sensitive to uh, thematics, which is we, we think that in the case of a country like China, especially, uh, state policy is very important. You do not want to be on the wrong side of the state. The state is so powerful and can make things happen that you go against it, you might end up losing a lot of money. So. Uh, we are very sensitive to what are the key themes that have been promoted by the state right now. Uh, it includes clean energy, for example, clean environment, self-sufficiency, uh, and uh, improving people's livelihood, uh, restricting uh, too much speculation in real estate. I think the president say the houses are for living in, not for speculating on, right? So you want to be on the right side of those uh, state policies. We call that thematics. We don't want to make it political. So these are some of the things that I mean by qualitative. If you get it right, you can imagine, for example, one of my tricks is that, can you imagine what the Financial Times or the uh, newspaper will say six months, 12 months, 18 months from today, the headlines? If you can, then you are likely to find a lot of catalysts beyond today's uh, expectations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr.